The scripture reading for this morning is taken from 2 Samuel chapter 11, verses 1 through 6. 2 Samuel 11, 1 through 6. It happened in the spring of the year, at the time when kings go out to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel. And they destroyed the people of Ammon and besieged Rabbah, but David remained at Jerusalem. Then it happened one evening that David arose from his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful to behold. So David sent and inquired about the woman. And someone said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Then David sent messengers and took her. And she came to him, and he lay with her. For she was cleansed from her impurity, and she returned to her house. And the woman conceived, so she sent and told David, and said, I am with child. Then David sent to Joab, saying, Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. No, we have a lot of folks out of town this morning. I just asked Harry where Darlene was, and uh, she's with her sister out of town today. Danetta and the girls are with the church in Athens, Blackburn Hill. Uh, this is, I don't know, girls' day. I don't know what they call it, but Danetta's with uh, Abby and uh, Maggie at OU. I know that. Uh, we have some folks at Harmer Hill this morning. The Antwines are there reporting on their work in Germany and some of our folks uh, generally support that work. We supported it for many, many years and uh, they're special people and so we have folks there as well. And I look around at a lot of empty pews and I'm so glad that they're not all empty. It's extremely difficult to preach to empty pews, and so I'm thankful for your presence, and I trust that our time together will be well spent. This morning's message is entitled, When Men Mess Up. Somebody asked me this past week, well, when will we address the question, when women mess up? Well, we're talking about men in a generic sense. Perhaps I should say when people mess up or humankind messes up. Because this is a problem that is common to all of us. Sin raises its ugly head in every life. As you well know, the only exception was the Lord himself. You and I are not going to be an exception. Sin is a problem we all face. I would submit to you the greatest problem we face. And the only remedy is in the person of Jesus Christ. I've selected this text and in fact the story of 2 Samuel 11 and 12 because it is so revealing and I think so filled with lessons that need to be learned and applied to every life. It's the story of King David. David, for those of you who are not careful Bible students, was the son of Jesse, the youngest of eight children, eight boys in Jesse's house. He grew up in Bethlehem. He would become the second king of Israel, successor to Saul, the son of Kish. In fact, in 1 Samuel 13, verse 14, as God contemplated the fall of Saul and the need for a successor, the record says that he'd found a man after his own heart. The Apostle Paul quotes that passage in Acts 13 and applies it to David, the son of Jesse. And of course, it's the correct understanding of the text. David was a special kind of person. He had a heart that was open and receptive to the will of God. And yet, 
He was a man who allowed himself to be overcome by temptation and led into sin. And I said he allowed himself because no one is forced to surrender to the devil. That is a conscious choice we make and one that David made in the context of our narrative this morning. Now, because some of you may not be as familiar with the text as we would like, let me quickly recount for you what unfolds in 2 Samuel 11 and 12. It's about this time of year, according to the narrative, the spring of the year, when kings lead their armies into battle. But David has chosen to stay home and has sent his commander Joab to lead the army of Israel against Rabbah. David is at home instead of being out with his men where he should have been. His time is not being occupied wisely and he's having trouble sleeping so he's on his rooftop gazing around. Now I am told, though I don't know this firsthand, that it was considered bad manners in biblical days for one to gaze on the courtyard or his neighbor's roof. But David is the king and we would assume that David felt that anything he wanted to do he was free to do. And so he's on his roof when he observes a woman Bathsheba bathing. She's a beautiful woman and David desired her. She is summoned They commit adultery, and out of that adulterous relationship, a child was conceived. This woman was married to one of David's trusted men. And David knew that he found himself in a very serious predicament. How can I remove myself from this dilemma, he thought. And then he came upon a plan. I will send to Joab and have him send Uriah, Bathsheba's husband, back to me for consultation. He will go home and spend the night with his wife and return to battle. And if he survives the war, he'll come home and think the child is his. Sounds like a plan. Surely it will work. But it didn't. Uriah returned. He informed the king of all that had taken place and... The king then dismissed him to return to his home and to his wife. But Uriah would not. In fact, he slept outside the king's residence with other servants. And the next day, David is beside himself. Why did you not go home? And Uriah's defense was, how could I do that? When everyone in Israel, the entire army, including Joab, are sleeping out in the open air or in tents... I could not. Well, David's plan is falling apart. So he alters it a little. The next day he invites Uriah in. And this time he gets him drunk. Just compounding the problem. Thinking surely now Uriah will return to his home and to his wife and problem solved. But again, Uriah does not. So the next day David writes a letter to Joab. And the essence of the letter was this. Put Uriah in the fiercest battle and withdraw from him so that he perishes. And there is no doubt that Uriah carried that letter, his own death sentence, from the king to Joab. And just as instructed, Joab placed Uriah in a position where death was certain. If you read the Septuagint, that's the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, in fact, 18 men died. As a result of David's transgression with Bathsheba and his efforts to cover it up, Uriah was killed. They approached too close to the wall and someone on the wall shot down and destroyed this noble servant. Word was sent back to King David, in essence, job done. 
all is well. And David thought, it's taken care of, and then chapter 12 unfolds. A prophet, you know him as Bible students, Nathan, came to the king and he had a story to tell. This is a parable, and what a powerful parable it is. There is in the same city two men. One of them is exceedingly wealthy. He has numerous flocks and herds. The other is a poor man. He has a single little lamb. He bought it as a youth. He raised it as one of the family. It drank from his cup. It ate from his morsel. It nestled in his lap. And then a visitor came to the rich man's estate. And the rich man, unwilling to take from his flocks and herds, took his neighbor's single little lamb and slew it to feed his guest. David, what do you think about that? What should be done with such a man? And David says, he ought to die and he ought to restore fourfold. And then Nathan looked at David and he spoke those powerful words. You are the man. And at that moment, David realized that all of his efforts to cover his tracks, so to, to speak, to hide his transgression, had been for naught. You see, this is a story that in so many ways ought to resonate with all of us because it's played out over and over and over again in the annals of human history. As men who think they are mightier than they really are, find themselves susceptible to temptation and then to sin. And with drastic consequences. Now again, if you know the narrative, you know that David acknowledged his transgression. And that's commendable. As the king, he could have simply commanded that the messenger Nathan be killed. But he did not. He said, I've sinned. And interestingly, Nathan said to him, and God has, in essence, forgiven your transgression. But know this, you will not escape the consequences of your actions. The sword will not be removed from your house. Troubles will follow you the remainder of your life. And that child, that son that is so dear and precious, he's going to die. And the remainder of 2 Samuel, as it chronicles the life of David, is a narrative fraught with heartache and misery. Three of his own sons ultimately will be murdered. Amnon. Absalom. And Adonijah, the king's heart will continue to break because of these actions, the consequences of his transgression. Again, forgiven, but still facing the consequences of what he had done. Now, given that story and the fact that you know it reasonably well, my question is, what do we take from it? What are the lessons that we need to focus on? And the first is this, sin's emergence is inescapable. One of the things that seems to pervade scripture is this idea that there are none righteous, no, not one. That all sin comes short of the glory of God. The wages of sin, death, the gift of God, eternal life. If we say we have no sin, we are liars and the truth is not in us. Ecclesiastes 7.20, Romans 3.10 and 23, Romans 6.23, and 1 John 1, 7 through 10. We are all guilty. The reality of sin is an ever-present part of every life, but the degree of that sin, that varies from person to person. In David's case, in the narrative that has been shared this morning, it is apparent that he is guilty of some of the worst kinds of crimes. There was the adultery. And whether you know it or not, it's indefensible. You know, in our modern society, 
If love is involved, anything and everything can be excused. But in the word of God, that's not the case. You take another man's wife as David took Bathsheba from Uriah. There is no defense for that. There's no argument that you can make to justify it. And David's going to have to come to terms with that. And it didn't stop there. Then this cover-up unfolds and the best laid plans fall through. David probably outlined his efforts in relationship to how he himself would have acted. Where he, in Uriah's place, summoned home, the first thing he would do after the king dismissed him would be to go home to his wife. And so he assumed that that would be the case with Uriah, but Uriah is more noble. Uriah is a man of real conviction. And he refuses. And then David gets him drunk. Again, that's indefensible. If you have any idea about what the scriptures say regarding alcoholism and alcoholic beverages and drunkenness, let me just tell you flat out, stay away from it all. Or you run the risk of losing it all. And then ultimately, David is responsible for the man's murder. No, he didn't draw the bow back and release the arrow that struck the soldier that led to his death. But he gave the order that caused it all to happen. And this is a man, remember, after God's own heart. You have to ask, or at least I have to ask, how conscientious are we in our lives and our efforts to avoid sin? Do we understand, really understand just how tragic sin is when we allow it to enter our lives? It can have disastrous consequences. And yes, it's emergence really is inescapable but to the extent that sin dominates and controls that's up to us as Christians Paul said know you not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey his servants you are to whom you obey whether of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness but thanks be to God that you were the servants of sin but no longer you've been set free not from the action of sin, but from its condemnation. We don't have to be slaves to the devil and to sin. Sin will be a part of every life. It is a mistake to argue that when one becomes a Christian, temptation vanishes and sin is no longer found in the lives of saints. What is true is we are no longer controlled and dominated by sin, but it will as it does in every life, raise its ugly head from, from time to time, that is inescapable. And furthermore, sin's detection is inevitable. Do you believe at the close of chapter 11 that David thought, I have gotten away with it? He had taken steps that would ensure that no one would ever know, and yet I submit to you that probably everyone already knew. Servants were involved in these transactions as Paul, or Paul, as David schemed and connived to extricate himself from this dilemma. And they're not going to be silent. The soldiers at the battle are going to know that this is not the normal process. We don't make these kinds of attacks. We don't draw close to the walls in a situation like this. In fact, again, if you read the text, chapter 12, there's even a reference to Abimelech who made the similar mistake at Thebes and a woman cast a millstone down from the wall and hit him in the head. And what's really tragic is his chief concern was 
is that he would forever be known as the man slain by the woman. Not that he was going to die as a result of his injuries, but injuries inflicted on a woman. It was well known that you don't approach the wall in this way. And his fellow soldiers had to figure out something wasn't right. You're not able, folks, ever to hide it. Certainly not from God, for he is one who sees all. In him everything is open and naked. Hebrews chapter 4. David was fooling himself when he thought, I can get away with it. I want you to know that we can't get away from sin any more than David could. Its discovery is inevitable. If not here, in the hereafter. Someday, listen to me, someday we will all stand before Jesus, our judge. And we will give an account for the things done in our body, whether good or evil. Contemplating that day, Paul wrote to the church of Corinth, Therefore, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 11. Verse 11 follows this acknowledgement in verse 10 that we'll all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Even if you are crafty enough, and I dare say none of us are, to keep sin hidden from family and friends and co-workers, it will in fact all come to light inevitably in judgment. This is a story about how forgiveness is attainable. And I really want you to understand here that David's sins, as we look at things, were among the greatest. Now, we generally argue that sin is sin, and all sin is abhorrent to God, and that is true, but some sins clearly have greater consequences than others. And the sins that David commit result in the most serious kinds of consequences. And yet, he found forgiveness. I find that in this story perhaps the most hope-filled and encouraging thing. That in spite of his transgression, forgiveness was still available. I have talked to people so many times who have said to me, you know, Roger, I believe, I believe the gospel. I really am convinced that Jesus was the Son of God and that he died, was buried, and rose the third day. His blood can wash away sin, but you just don't understand. My life has been so wicked, so vile, so sin-filled, that there just really isn't any hope for me. Doesn't this story deny that? If David could find forgiveness of adultery, murder, and everything that was involved, there's hope for us. It may be, though I can't say with certainty, that Paul thought about that as he thought about his own life and wrote that he was the chief, the worst of sinners. And yet he said, I found forgiveness that I might be a pattern for all who follow after what had that man done? Well, he had set out to destroy the church. He had gone from place to place simply hunting down Christians, bringing them to trial, testifying against them, and yes, even seeing some put to death. I really can't think of anything that compares, and yet he found forgiveness. I want you to know that you matter to God, that Jesus died to save you, and there is nothing in your past that cannot be forgiven when you seek forgiveness in the right way. Think of Peter. He said as they made their way from the upper room to the garden, if they all forsake you, Lord, not me, 
And Jesus said before the rooster crows twice, you will have denied me three times. I'm ready to die with you. And when he said that, I don't question his motives, his sincerity. I believe that he believed that he was ready to die with the Lord. But as we say, when push came to shove, it was a different story. He said, I don't know the man. Why, you're a Galilean, your speech betrayed. I never, never knew the man. Have no part with him. After that third denial, he looked into the eyes of the Lord. His heart just melted. He went out and wept bitterly. And there's no doubt that he too found forgiveness, as did David, as did Paul, as can all of us, but on his terms, not ours. There must be genuine repentance, reformation, a change. Jesus did not tell the adulterous woman in John 8, you're fine. I don't condemn you. He said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Read John 8, 1 through 11. We're willing to turn our back on sin and turn to God just like David or Paul or Peter. Forgiveness is available. It is attainable. Furthermore, sin's consequences are avoidable. You know, God's prescription for life is there for a reason. When he tells us to avoid something, it's because it's in our best interest to avoid it. And when he urges us to embrace something, it's because when we do, our lives are going to be enriched. We will simply be guided by the word, the lamp to our feet, the light to our path. Life will be so much better. And when we turn from the way, the consequences, even when forgiveness is sought and found, will be unavoidable. I want to quickly share with you from 2 Samuel chapter 12 the consequences that would befall King Saul, even though he has been forgiven. Now therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Violence will follow him wherever he goes. Thus says the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he shall be with your wives in the sight of the sun. That is where all will see and know. And he says, Nevertheless, because of this deed, you have utterly scorned the Lord, The child who is born to you shall die. Three dire consequences of a sinful man's actions. Actions that were forgiven, but consequences remain. Is it not far better to follow God's prescription for life and avoid the bad consequences of sin than to surrender to temptation later to find forgiveness, but then to face all of those consequences, sometimes for the rest of our lives. David could never escape, no matter how hard he tried, the consequences of his action. He poured out his heart to God in Psalm 51, crying, Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right spirit. My sins are ever before me. Avoid, if you can consequences of sin by standing steadfast against Satan and not yielding to temptation. The promise of 1 Corinthians 10, 13 is that, no, 13, 10, no temptation will ever confront us, but what in the face of that temptation, God will provide the means or the way of escape. Look at 1 Corinthians 13, 10, and 11. Finally, favorite word in any sermon, sin's proliferation is preventable. This did not have to play out as it did. David could have confronted his adultery, acknowledged his sin, and as we would say, take his medicine. But he didn't. 
One sin leads to another sin and another sin and another sin. It just compounds the problem. It doesn't have to be that way. Again, whatever haunts your past can be overcome through the blood of Christ. You can live for God, and you can be with him eternally. But you have to make a conscious choice to be governed by his word. That's why we urge careful, prayerful study of scripture on a daily basis. That we not only know what the Bible says, that we embrace it wholeheartedly and commit ourselves to doing it, even then. There will be times in our lives when sin will raise its ugly head. But please, please, don't allow yourself to become servants of sin as David did. Or it can complicate your life in such tragic ways. And if unrepented, it can cost you your soul eternally. You know, I look at what has taken place here in our own nation over the last many years. And I remind myself that men today are so much like men 3,000 years ago, David. Sin is still there in all of its forms, but through Jesus Christ we can overcome. There is forgiveness and there is hope for eternity. I want to close, as we typically do, by urging those who are not Christians to examine carefully God's word and commit with all of your heart to believing what is contained therein. Open your heart to the gospel as Lydia did by hearing the word and be willing to change, to repent. We'll take your confession and we can in short order immerse you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for the remission of your sins. Not that we believe there's water, power in the water to wash away sins. Nothing but the blood can cleanse the soul of sin. But the point that the blood is applied is in our faithful, obedient response to the call of the gospel in immersion where the old man is buried and a new man is raised to walk in newness of life. And I'm not telling you when that happens the problems are all solved. The burdens are all lifted. But I'm telling you, you don't face them alone now. Jesus has promised to be at your side every step of the way. Maybe you've done what you needed to do, but you've been unfaithful. You've lost your way and you need to come back home. And that can be easily correct it as well. If you just come, say, as Simon said to Peter, pray for me, we will. And God has promised to hear and forgive, and you can be right with him once more. Nothing, absolutely nothing, is more important or more urgent. So consider your soul's salvation, your relationship to God through Christ, and what you need to do. Do it right now. It's together we stand and sing.